Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I am your host, Simon Wammers here. David has written me a script. This one's all about Pedro Lopez, Monster of the Andes. Uh, never heard of this one. I feel like Monster of the Andes is definitely ringing bells, but I mean, maybe I just don't remember the dude's name. The crime maybe feels familiar. Anyway, uh, I'm gonna read it. This is a cold read if you're new here. I've never read this before. We go on a little bit of an exploration together. It's gonna be fun. I say fun. The episode is called Monster of the Andes. It's probably not going to be fun. Uh, there's probably going to be the usual tropes of criminals not being very good at crime and getting caught. <laughs> it's the casual criminalist after all. Uh, I'm going to read it. Then Jen afterwards, our wonderful video and audio editor, is going to add in some uh, images if you're watching this on YouTube. In which case, hello. And if you're listening, well, also hello. As I always say, I'll paint a picture with my words. I mean, David will. He wrote it. I just sit here and read stuff. <laughs> Let's go. Today's episode of The Casual Criminalist comes as a result of several dozen audience member requests in the YouTube comments on Twitter, and when they occur, in user reviews of the podcast version of this show, and I would be remiss in my duty as a podcast host and YouTube fact boy to say, yo, if you are listening to this, why not go and give the podcast a review? That would be fantastic. Spotify now even supports. I don't think they support reviews, but you can give it a rating. And I saw people hitting me up on Twitter, being like, uh, yo, Simon, I reviewed uh, The Casual Criminalist on Spotify, and it's got like a perfect five-star rating. I'm sure it doesn't now, because as soon as you say that, <laughs> people are like, ah, <laughs> one star, let's drop that down to 4.9, because one single one-star review will do that. No one has a perfect five, unless no one listens, in which case you could have a perfect five, because it's just your mum reviewing, isn't it? Which is, I mean, <laughs> at least there's that. I can confirm that I do monitor the comments and take requests, so feel free to make them. Uh-oh, David, what have you done? <laughs> I mean, that's a lie. No, I mean, it's great to ask. Uh, leave suggestions in the comments below. Generally, the ones that rise to the top. I mean, there's thousands or hundreds of comments, usually. Either way, today's story is a grim crescendo of ever-mounting dread and repugnant evil before crashing down into the ruins and ashes of one of the most chaotic, appalling, and sinister endings that I've ever seen in true crime. Oh. <laughs> Brilliant. This is going to be fun. <laughs> I just recorded yesterday that one about Israel Keys, which I don't know if it'll come out before or after this or whatever, because sometimes it doesn't happen in order because sponsors are like, oh, you got to put this one there. We need this one to go out on the 13th. <laughs> really? Really? The 13th? That's the day you want? <laughs> that specific? Um, but that was also horribly brutal. I see David's just finished me one up about Kim Kardashian's robbery. I should have. I feel like I should have just put that one in between so I can regain some semblance of, you know, faith in humanity. Not that Kim Kardashian getting robbed is a good thing, but it's it's not a horrible murder, is it? <laughs> and those ones get less views, but I need them. I actually need them, or I'll go insane. And honestly, you should need them too. <laughs> You really couldn't make this stuff up, so thanks for the suggestion, ladies and gentlemen. If you're in the market for displays of utterly vile human behavior and deep psychosis, combined with just a pinch of general atrocious police incompetence and dereliction of duty, then you've come to the right place. I mean, I, I feel I've interrupted this episode like a hundred times so far. I promise it, I will slow down as I settle into it today. But I mean, that is basically what the Casual Criminalist is, isn't it? It's like bad people getting caught by bad cops. And not bad like bad cops, just like not very good. Sometimes it's bad people caught by good cops, and that's like the best thing. Like a bit of police super competence, I love. It reminds me it's like CSI. Boom! And now, my friends, once more into the darkness. Meet Pedro Lopez. Pedro Alonso Lopez was born on October the 8th, 1948, in the tiny mountain village of Santa Isabel, Colombia. At the time, civil war had just broken out between the liberal and conservative factions in what is bluntly called La Violencia, a war that would last over 10 years and claim the lives of 250,000 people. I just made a video about FARC for my uh, Into the Shadows channel, and we covered this in depth. So if you fancy that, check it out. Why not? A little bit of self-promotion there. Uh, taking the lives of 250,000 people and injuring a further 800,000 people and displacing yet another million people. The majority of the war was conducted in the countryside, plaguing towns just like Santa Isabel. The Civil War killed 2% of the country's population at the time and plunged an already poor nation deep 
into poverty and lawlessness. The government was highly corrupt and incompetent, and the murder rate skyrocketed to the highest in the world at the time. In short, here was yet another hellscape in which yet another psychopath was born and his spirit contorted. Just like Andrei Chikolito in Stalinist Ukraine. And if you don't know what that reference is, ah, boy, you missed an episode, didn't you? That one was absolutely horrific. It is worth noting that the similarities don't stop there. Oh god, I can't take another Chikolito one. <laughs> That was the guy, I don't want to talk about it, but it was just awful. Pedro Lopez's father, Medardo Reyes, was a member of the conservative faction and, and had been killed more than three months before Pedro was born. Pedro was the seventh child of a family of 13 children, raised by his single mother, Benilda Lopez de Castaneda. When Pe little Pedro was five, while the Civil War was still raging, his mother moved the family to the city of El Espinal in search of refuge from the worst fighting and also on a quest for money. The city's name, meaning spinal backbone, El Espinal was a city embedded deep within the nervous system of the Andes of the Andes Mountain. It had a much larger population and was the rice capital of Colombia. Pedro's mother thought that this would be much easier pickings for her particular kind of trade. Uh, what is her trade? Benilda Lopez claims that she gave her son a loving upbringing and that Pedro was always a bright and friendly child who dreamed of being a teacher. At least that was according to Mummy. Pedro Lopez, meanwhile, alleged that his mother was physically abusive to the extreme, even going so far as to say that she was, quote, sick in the head. That is not the way to punish your children. She punished me with such violence. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, these cash criminalists they are like largely the same it's like a kid is born into troubled circumstances and he is abused by his parents next up comes killing animals trouble as a teenager and eventually murder possibly with a sexual element that is repeated and they're eventually caught by a slip up of their own <laughs> that's the casual criminalist everybody <laughs> Meanwhile, the Lopez family was mired in poverty, and Benilda paid what lit for what little they had by working as a prostitute. When she fell pregnant, she merely had the baby, and the already poor family just got larger. As a child, Pedro witnessed dozens of men coming to their apartment and using his mother this way, and frequently these men would become violent and hit her. This was either because of a disagreement over the price, or sometimes because that was simply what they paid for. This first premature exposure to the sexual act being marred in violence. <laughs> premature exposure? Should there be any exposure to sexual violence? <laughs> I don't feel like that's something. I mean, okay, if you're doing it and it's like a kink that you're into and everyone is a willing participant, okay. Okay, if you're into that, fine. I'm not judging. But if it's uh, if it's not willing by both parties and stuff, then it's like that's not something people should ever be exposed to. Not prematurely, not maturely. Never. Um, compounded by the fact that his mother was in turn allegedly violent to him, made him a lot made a lasting impression in Pedro's mind. A connection was being forged at a very tender age between sex and violence that would later contort Pedro's own feelings of arousal, his attitudes towards women, and promote a form of sexual sadism. Everyone now is like Simon, you big brain. How did you know, just two paragraphs earlier, that it was going to be violence linked with sex? <laughs> Tell you why. <laughs> it's well worn path, isn't it? In 1956, when Pedro was only eight, he left home and went to live on the streets. His mother, Belinda, alleges that Pedro ran away from home of his own accord. She claims that she wept for days and days after he left and rushed out into El Espinal looking for him. Benilda claims that she suspected a neighbor kidnapped Pedro, or worse, she said the liberal faction had abducted and killed her son just as they had killed her husband. What the liberal guerrillas would accomplish by kidnapping and murdering an eight-year-old son of an impoverished alleged prostitute, however, is difficult to say. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that does seem extremely unlikely. It sounds like he ran away because you were beating him doesn't it? That's kind of what it sounds like, Benny. Pedro Lopez, on the other hand, gives a slightly different account about why he left home. Lopez states that one day in 1956, he was caught groping the breasts of one of his sisters. Uh-oh. Trying to initiate sex. He was eight years old. Take that information as you will. For the incestuous sexual assault, Lopez claims that his mother threw him out of the house and told him never to return. Despite being eight years old and having nowhere to go, apparently Lopez complied and did not return. He's eight. <laughs> Send him to therapy. <laughs> Don't throw him out. You're literally making a psychopath right now. <laughs> Isn't that that Netflix show, Making of a Murderer? This is how you make a murderer. You may by this point have noticed that this story has a problem with unreliable narrators. <laughs> yeah, a lot of these do. 
Regardless of the true version of events that led him there, now homeless eight-year-old Pedro slept in the streets, gutters, alleyways, and abandoned buildings of El Espinal. He fed himself by digging through the trash for rotting food and also by begging for money. Needless to say, this resulted in suffering malnutrition, gaining a skeletal physique with a distended belly. According to Lopez, quote, I remember being a lively and energetic child innocent. Then, in the majority of my childhood, I lived in filth and sleazy places. My life had been dishonest because I was abandoned. The years can take someone and change them drastically. The absolute thinnest of silver linings was only the nights in El Aspinal, even in winter, didn't get particularly cold. But this was hardly comfort to a scared child with an empty belly, sleeping amid the rats and refuse of the city. Yeah, this is so crazy. I can't... Children aren't homeless in, like, I don't know... I think about the UK. I think of where I live now. Check. And it's like, there's no homeless children. <laughs> homeless children go somewhere. And they're like, okay, we'll take you inside. You're a child. <laughs> there are homeless adults, of course. But I mean, I don't want to blame homeless adults for being homeless. But it's like, they obviously have more responsibility in it than an eight-year-old. It's also interesting how, like, I, I just recording that Israel Keys one yesterday. It's so fresh in my mind. How that guy was just born. That guy was born and he was a sicko crazy not don't you i won't use the word crazy because it's like it's too broad and sweeping but like um he was a bad dude he was born bad he didn't have emotions and he liked killing people this guy is he's like more born this guy's more made right i don't know i don't know what i'm talking about i'm not a psychologist psychiatrist or whatever that is but i just feel it sometimes you're like this guy's being made by his parents Pedro Lopez was not on the streets more than a few weeks before he was approached by a concerned man who invited the child to his house for a hot meal and a bed to sleep in for the night. Pedro accepted the man's kind offer and was taken to an abandoned warehouse where the stranger, stranger forcibly sodomized him before turning, his back, turning him back out onto the streets. Dude, you piece of sh**. Pedro could not go to the police, who were not at their most effective due to the high crime rates, the civil war, and the tendency to ignore the problems of the heaving throngs of the city's poor. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Obviously, you've got to think about the problems of the rich people first. Uh, they're the ones who are mostly paying for it. <laughs> this is terrible. I hope, uh, obviously, I'm joking. I hope that you take note of that last point because it is something that's going to become a theme in today's story, as it does in many casual criminalists. <laughs> Police work. Shocking. So traumatized was the young boy by the experience that he ceased talking to anyone, and for two months he would only venture out at night in search of food in the city's trash bins. He was utterly isolated and alone. During the day he spent time curled up, sleeping in alleys, or if he was lucky, an abandoned building, before El Espinal's other homeless people scared him off. Not only was Pedro scared of talking to them, but due to the extreme poverty of the times, the vast mass of the city's homeless waged a nightly war over the prime real estate of the city's more sheltered sleeping spots. Just like his alleged treatment at the hands of his mother, Pedro's rape by a stranger who claimed to mean well, the severely damaged the young boy's fragile psyche. Lopez said, I don't deny it has affected me. I have always wanted to punish those responsible. I hated it. When I see a certain type of person, like a male adult, that doesn't respect a young boy, I make it a point to set that person straight. Pedro's world was one of war, poverty, and predation, where the people he wanted to trust the most turned out to be cruel. He never knew a normal childhood and developed a distorted view of humanity. This not only twisted Pedro's moral compass, but it also deeply embittered his heart. Here was the first step on the long road of Pedro Lopez's twisted quest for vengeance on the entire human race. This is so crazy. Eight years old. That keeps coming back to my mind just as I'm reading this. I remember being eight years old. I couldn't do shit. I was eight. Ma'am, I'm eight years old. The idea of having to like fend for yourself at that age is just absolutely wild. Nuts. Oliver Twist on crack. After a couple of months of sleeping rough on the streets, eight-year-old Pedro Lopez made the 90-mile or 156, 146, sorry, kilometer long trek on foot from an Espinal to Bogota, Colombia's capital city. Bogota is a sprawling metropolis composed of millions of people and constituting between 15 and 20 percent of the country's population. During La Violencia, Bogota was the ultimate prize for both sides, but by and large, the city was a refuge for those escaping the guerrilla warfare of the countryside and the mountains. Like El Espinal, Bogota is also situated high in the Andes, and in 1956 was surrounded by fertile wetlands that have since largely been wiped out. A somewhat picturesque city from a distance, Bogota is also something of a dystopian hellhole worthy of Blade Runner cyberpunk 
or League of Legends. By moving to Bogota, Pedro Lopez disappeared amidst the slums and fell into a community of thousands upon thousands of homeless street urchins. Most of these children were either orphans from war or, like Pedro, they were escaping abusive households. Needless to say, social services in Colombia in 1956 were not nearly robust enough to handle such large numbers of disadvantaged kids, so they were left to fend for themselves. The nickname for these street kids was Los Gamines. They operated in, as a complex network of beggars, thieves, and street gangs in order to survive. I can see why this section's titled Oliver Twist. Uh, there's going to be crack involved. Maybe they're dealing crack or something. But it feels very Oliver Twist. Pedro quickly joined one such street gang, and, with it, and within that juvenile alliance, he helped defend the gang's territory or the small slice of Bogota that the gang claimed for theft, begging, and prime sleeping spots. Violence between the gangs was frequent, sometimes almost nightly, being fought with clubs, primitive knuckle dusters, broken bottles, knives, chains, and belts. More than once, Pedro witnessed another child being killed by the other children. Holy shit, my dudes. This is, this is a, like Blade Runner shit. The homeless girls among the city started working as sex workers as young as 12 or even 9. What the f***? The Gamines also had to watch out for adults who might abduct them, murder them, sexually assault them, or even conscript them as bullet fodder for paramilitary groups. Some authorities, oh my god. I'm like, I, I think like, <laughs> sometimes I'm like, yeah, my, my upbringing was pretty good, quite privileged. And then you read something like this and it's like, oh my god, I'm like the most privileged person ever. Oh! Can you imagine? Can you imagine growing up in this situation? Christ, no wonder this guy became a murderer. I'm not saying I'd become a murderer if I was in this situation. But it'd definitely be more likely, wouldn't it? I think it'd be more likely for everybody. Some authorities thought the Gamines were such a nuisance with their constant fighting and pickpocketing that they'd turn a blind eye to any militias that went out hunting them. By 1970s, Colombian street children had earned a second nickname, Los de Sechal. Los Desechables, or The Disposables. My apologies to the Colombian Tourist Board for not making Historic Bogota sound so good. That's okay, David. Sounds like Historic Bogota was a piece of shit. <laughs> it's like Bogota, it's like a list of destinations that are. Even now, I don't know much about Bogota, but it's not really on the top of my list to go visit. It's probably lovely now. The Civil War is long over. It's probably economically developed. <laughs> but it sounds horrible in the past. If I ever get my time machine working, well, I won't go there. In addition to finally speaking to other humans again and learning how to be a thief and a street brawler, much of Pedro's daily life didn't change from El Espinal. His primary diet was still half-rotten food fished out of the trash. He was still rail-thin and filthy. While still only a child, Pedro began smoking ba basuco, a low-grade cocaine paste with which Colombia's poor laced their cigarettes. Oh my. The name basuco is derived from the Spanish word for dirty trash because the cocaine paste is stuff scraped from the bottle of the barrel after cocaine production. Highly addictive and more potent than crack, it contains a number of dangerous chemicals like acids, kerosene, and trace elements of rubber and plastic. It can cause violent mood swings, delusions, and paranoia, and Pedro is hooked on it. In 1958, when Pedro was 10 years old, uh, he was spotted on the street by a highly religious American couple who had moved from the USA to Colombia for work. Such was Pedro's thin and filthy appearance that the American couple felt heartbroken looking at him. After painstakingly earning the trust of this jumpy and frightened kid, they took Pedro home, fed him, and gave him a place to sleep. After two years living in an urban hellscape and an earlier childhood living in a broken home, Pedro finally had a stable family and home life. He got decent meals and got to play like a normal child. He was gradually weaned off cigarette and basuco. Grad generally speaking, Pedro behaved himself while well, living with the American couple, being quite frankly relieved to have been pulled off of his life on the streets. Man, it's got to be like after what happened to him previously, where he got raped by that the guy who was like to you know saying he'll give you a hot meal you can't it's like that's got to destroy your trust the couple enrolled pedro in a local jesuit school for orphans pedro began his formal education learning the basics of reading writing and arithmetic for the first time and he passed two stable years living like this but for one incident pedro's story may have ended there a triumph of charity over adversity but in 1960, when Pedro was 12 years old, he was molested by a male teacher at the school. The betrayal of yet another adult authority figure further traumatized Pedro and brought back horrific memories of his earlier years. His distrust of adults came rushing back. Pedro promptly stole money from the school's main office and disappeared back into the streets without a trace, never seeing the American couple again. That's f***ing people, man. People are such pieces of sh**. From that point forward, all Pedro expected from other people was betrayal. Later in life, Pedro would comment on this incident. I'm an adult man. 
I've led a backward life. I have become disorientated, deluded, or because I lack support and help when that is what I needed the most. Some of you may be thinking that Pedro should have stayed with the American family, and you'd be right. Pedro would very likely have been better off, but from the perspective of a heavily traumatized child, you might be able to understand how he wished to return to the familiar environment of the streets where life was tough, but at least it was one of self-reliance where Pedro felt he had more control over his own destiny. Every time Pedro had consorted, consorted with the world of adults and normal society, he seemed to get hurt. Yeah, I mean, I get it. Like, if... I feel, in a way, like that betrayal of trust, at least if you're on the streets, everyone's a piece of shit. Like, I don't want to say that. <laughs> not, not all the homeless people are pieces of shit. That's not what I mean. Like, these kids are fighting each other and killing each other in the streets, right? And the adults are using them as, like, bullet fodder in their guerrilla war and all this crazy stuff. But at least you know what you're getting. At least you know what you're getting. Whereas when you get, like, sexually assaulted by a person who's supposed to care for you, it's like, that is worse. Because at least the gorilla is like, well, look, yeah, we're going to take you to the jungle and you're going to have to, like, be a child soldier. And you're like, well, that sucks. But, you know, I don't know. It feels like, it feels, at least you know what you're getting. Which, I mean, good lord. Talk about a choice between two horrible things. But that security, in quotes, is nice, right? <laughs> nice. What are you saying, Bax Boy? It's not nice that they're taking off to fight in a civil war. I hope I'm like getting across a tiny bit of what I'm trying to say. I'm not very eloquent, apparently. Now, just before we continue with today's video, I do want to give a big shout out, big thank you to today's wonderful sponsor, HelloFresh. Yes, HelloFresh. Oh, what do they do? They help you reach your goals. Look, it's a new year, isn't it? New Year's resolution time. What's it going to be? Eat less fast food. Get less takeaway. <laughs> Try and become a healthier and better person. Oh, it's so hard. But it's not as hard as you think with HelloFresh. Yes, that's right. Getting a home-cooked meal on the table every day is an accomplishment worth celebrating. I mean, I guess. I guess. I guess it is. Because I eat takeout way too often. <laughs> Let HelloFresh help with 50 weekly menu and market items to choose from so you can think less about what's for dinner and more about achieving your goals. Yeah, they've got these calorie smart things. They've got these carb smart things. It's just delicious meals without the worries. So it's not like, you know, when you're like, oh, calorie smart, it's like, yeah, I got the tuna sub. You're like, oh, but I really wanted the other thing. No, these are tasty. They're not just like some super calorie saving meal that leaves you hungry and unsatisfied. HelloFresh, they thought about that and they do it right. They're delicious. I think we already said that, but um, oh yeah, there's the recipe rut thing. I don't know about you guys. I always cook the same things over and over again, and it just gets a little tiresome and bothersome because after work, I'm like, oh, I just don't want to think about it. I just want to, you know, just cook and be done with it. But HelloFresh, they give you lots of new options. They and you learn new things. You learn more about cooking, which is nice. Obviously, you save time and stress. There's no grocery store shopping, all of that stuff, and sustainability. You wouldn't think it. You'd be like, well, isn't this going to come in a bunch of packaging and all of that stuff? Well, it's all very sustainably done. And also, think about the amount of crap you throw away after you've been to the store. I don't know about you, but for me, it's outrageous. There are bags within bags within bags, and I'm like, who is doing this? And why are we destroying our planet? Why are we so horrible? And HelloFresh, it's just, it's exactly, it's pre-proportioned. There's no throwing away stuff. And you know, you never say you throw it away. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I just put it in the fridge for later. But three days later, when it's gone all soggy and you don't want to eat that salad anymore, you throw it away, don't you? So it's all very wasteful. Um, Look, it's at this point they say, endorse it with some cooking footage. I can't. I I've never eaten HelloFresh because it's not available where I live. But I sent it to a mate in the US and he's always like, this is great. <laughs> free food and it's easy and so he provides the footage which you see now and he has assured me that it is straight up wonderful so look go to hellofresh.com and use the code criminalist16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts go to hellofresh.com use code ca uh, criminalist16 for 16 free meals and three surprise gifts that's fantastic thank you hellofresh and now back to the video gone in 60 seconds Pedro returned to his life of smoking, bazooka, and running with Bogota street gangs. He soon rose through the ranks. Even at a young age, Pedro became a fairly accomplished thief and con artist. By the age of 16 in 1964, he graduated being a car thief. 
Pedro would steal cars from around the city and take them to one of Bogota's many chop shops, which would break down the car into parts and sell them separately. While not really making a substantial living in, at this, since it might be fair to say that barely anyone in Bogota made a decent living, Pedro was at least able to get some decent clothes and keep himself properly fed as he matured into an adult man. By the age of 18, he was a highly respected car thief in Bogota's underworld and even began training up younger teens to do the same in exchange for a cut of the proceeds. While I can't condone car thievery, I'm not sure right, what I would have done to survive as a street kid trapped in an environment as horrible as the slums of Bogota in the 1960s. I don't know, I'd have definitely committed crimes. 100%. If, I, if that's what I had to do to survive, and knowing that the police are utterly useless, of course I'd commit crimes to survive. I don't think that may. <laughs> Wait, now I'm saying like, yeah, definitely. I mean, not like murder, but definitely thieving. I'd definitely steal shit if I was hungry. Of course I would. Is that bad? <laughs> I don't even know. You do what you gotta do, and when it's over, you quit and give yourself a decent life. The downside in 2020. I think I also missed the boat on Bitcoin. In 1969, at the age of 21, Pedro Lopez's career as a car thief came to an end. He was caught by the police handling a stolen vehicle, arrested, and given a two-year sentence in prison. Pedro had only been locked up for two days when he was beaten and gang-raped by four other, four other inmates. Good lord. This enraged the now adult man, bringing back all sorts of traumatizing memories from his childhood. In response, Pedro spent the evening fashioning a shiv out of a dull butter knife. The next day, in a blitz attack, he burst into each of the inmate cells while they were alone, and one day, and one by one, Pedro Lopez stabbed each of them repeatedly before they could defend themselves. Each attack took no more than a minute. Pedro Lopez managed to kill three out of the four rapists, with the fourth inmate surviving his attack in critical condition. Such was the state of the Colombian prison system that, according to Lopez, the jail warden said, quote, It's nothing. Don't worry about it. I mean, in a way, this was probably the right thing. I mean, I'm not saying that murder's right, <laughs> obviously. I feel like I'm qualifying an awful lot of shit I'm saying in this video because it's like when you start, you know, you when you start putting yourself in someone else's position where there's just bad choices, even, even the good choices are bad, you feel like you need a qualifier. But it's like, in terms of like surviving in prison, <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, they're probably not going to mess with that psycho again. <laughs> The prison authorities determined that Lopez had committed the murders in self-defense, not because he had killed them in the heat of the rapist's initial assault, but because of being locked up in the prison, the inmates were likely to try it again, possibly ending up with Lopez's own death. As endemic as rape is to many of the world's prison systems, in Colombia especially, the guards didn't have the resources or, frankly, even the plain interest in preventing violence from breaking out among inmates. Short of a full-blown prison riot that could potentially result in breakouts, prison authorities turned a blind eye. Additionally, in the rough and ready culture of the 1960s Colombian prison system, it was deemed highly disgraceful to be sodomized by another man, and the act of dishonor could only be expunged by an appropriate act of revenge. As such, prison murders like this were quietly condoned by the authorities, and Colombian jails operated essentially along their own informal legal codes. Yeah, prison is somewhere, like, it sounds horrible enough today. And you're probably like, compared to the past, prison's probably really nice. Like, pr places I don't want to go, 1960s Colombia prison. <laughs> That prison where the man in the iron mask was kept. It's just that was much worse. Or I don't know, any of those Asian prisons, like the Bangkok Hilton and stuff. Oh. Asian prison sounds like the worst. And I've been to Asia. And you're going through the airport. And there's big signs saying, like, remember, we hang drug dealers. And you're like, oh my god, I'm not a drug dealer, but I'm just going to check. Like, every time I go, I'm like, I'm pretty sure that at no point did I put, like, some weed in my backpack. But any time I travel to one of those countries, I'm like, let's just search every pocket extremely thoroughly just in case I'm accidentally becoming a drug smuggler and I'm going to go to be hung in, like, some crazy prison in Singapore. It's like, no! Okay, what are we talking about? In the end, the authorities wound up only adding another two years to Pedro Lopez's prison sentence for the murders of three men and the attempted murder of a fourth. While I was in prison, I learned how to defend myself, Lopez later said. Indeed, he was never given any more serious trouble in the remaining four years he spent there. <laughs> yeah, no sh**. Lopez did not join a prison gang, though he occasionally fraternized with other inmates. He remained largely solitary. He was left alone by his fellow convicts for one simple, re simple reason. Lopez cultivated the image of being that one inmate who seems to be in every prison, that appears to be an unpredictable, rabid animal. Completely nuts. If you messed with him, you'd be taking your life into your own hands. At this juncture in his life, Lopez's own mental instability, babbling rants and violent mood swings, serve to emphasize this point. It's like, yeah, it's probably also definitely 
if you're in prison, like, you, you, you know, maybe just play that up a little bit. Play up that you're that psycho who can absolutely just completely flip out for no reason. <laughs> Lopez spent his days smoking cigarettes and lazing about in his cell. He gradually collected the porn magazines that occasionally filtered into the prison. Eventually, Lopez built up quite a collection and avidly consumed pornography while he was incarcerated. According to Lopez, he was conflicted over his masturbatory habits. On the one hand, he felt a need to satiate his biological impulses, and he certainly wasn't going to sexually assault his fellow inmates given his own experience. On the other hand, he found the women in the porn magazines repulsive. The graphic acts in which they were engaged reminded him of his mother, sullied, soiled, completely lacking in innocence. Ultimately, such in uh, images did not stimulate him and set him sexually, and so Pedro Lopez began fantasizing about other things. Lopez would later claim that after his rape in prison, that was the final straw. He had been beat up all his life. When he was released, he would exact revenge on humanity. According to Lopez, he had an innocence stolen from him at the age of eight, so he would take an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. My, I mean, like, can't we just go down the different path? I always think of, like, the Dexter TV show. It's like, can't we go the Dexter path? Where it's like, look, 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 you've been assaulted by people who are terrible pieces of sh**. So if you're going to become a murderer and you're going to take revenge on humanity, why don't we not go after children, you know? who are, I, I don't know if that's where this is going, but it sounds like it, doesn't it? Why don't we go after the piece of sh** who actually did this to you? Why not go find that man who raped you in that warehouse? Why not, you know, kill him? Just kill him and then find other people who are doing that. And kill them as well i mean i'm not condoning that in any way but again it's one of those things where it's like look there are two bad choices <laughs> if you have to choose between one of the two do we murder the murderer or do we murder innocent child obviously <laughs> obviously you murder the murderer not controversial i am god to quote what Pedro Lopez said in one of his many press interviews, I've always lived in poverty. I have ambition of being powerful one day, of great importance. I understand what I have done. There's no going back. As we shall see, Lopez had a rather grim and mutated way of achieving importance. Pedro Lopez was released from prison in 1973. From there, Lopez's movements go dark for half a decade. We don't... How could, don't they keep track of people when they leave prison? Isn't that a thing you go to like uh, a halfway house and they put you on probation i want to say where it's like you have to check in with a parole dude and make sure that you're not being a criminal again it's just like no 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 you're good mate even though you've murdered three people in prison you'll be fine on the outside let's not keep it on you at all <laughs> just feel free to disappear uh we do know that from 1973 to 1978 lopez had no fixed address and moved between bogota and el espinal occasionally making forays out to other cities in the countryside occasionally lopez would visit his mother with whom he had re-established relations now that he was an adult. Yet Lopez's visits to his mother to his mother rarely ended on good terms. According to Benilda, Pedro would be overly confrontational and cruel and then leave. In 1978, Pedro Lopez traveled to Peru. There he appears on our radar again during a troubling incident. Dwelling in the countryside and the forests of Peru are the various tribes and confederacies of the Chanka people. There are largely aboriginal ethnicity with various dialects and, uh, and subcultures spread across multiple regions of the country. The Chanka are a traditional agrarian society and endeavor to remain as untouched as possible by modernity. They resisted conquest by the Incan Empire and they resisted the Spanish conquistadors. Even today, they strive to hold off the encroachments of the Peruvian government and are largely left to their own devices. In a word, you don't want to fuck with them. In 1978, a number of young girls between the ages of 8 and 12 had gone missing from a local Chanka community, never to be found again. Oh. Why? We were just talking about this. It's why... I. I mean, I know it's because he's broken and his mind is broken, but it's like, if you were victimized as an eight-year-old, surely when you're like, let's get revenge on humanity, you'll be like, who should we go after? Other eight-year-olds? That makes no sense. Or predators. That makes sense, doesn't it? One day, Pedro Lopez was discovered trying to lure a nine-year-old Chanka girl away, from in away into the forest. Lopez has said to the girl that he was lost and asked her to help him find his way back to a road. An angry mob of Chankas chased Lopez, grabbed him, and buried him in sand up to his neck. They suspected that he was responsible for the recent disappearances of the young girls in the community. According to Lopez, the Chankas were about to pour syrup on his face so he'd be stung, stung repeatedly by a swarm of thousands of highly toxic bullet ants. Perhaps a fanciful sounding story to western ears but actually well within reason for punishments in that region yeah i'd say that sounds entirely like reasonable <laughs> it's like how should we kill this guy well let's uh, have the ants do it and bury him in sand because he's a horrible monster who's been murdering our children <laughs> doesn't sound that bad i mean yeah go for it chanka people 
It sounds that sounds good. However, a Christian missionary worker intervenes. Our oh, classic Christian mission. Why are you intervene? Just let it be. He's done some horrible things. She convinced the Chancas to instead deliver Lopez to the local police. Lopez, I know that the police are going to botch this. They definitely are. And we're all going to return to this moment when the Chancas had him buried, the, buried in the stands and covered with syrup. Uh, do you have any more syrup? Sorry, Earth. Lopez was tied up with rope and thrown in the back of the missionary's jeep. The woman drove Joe Lopez to the local police station. There, the attending officer could not really determine that there was any evidence that Lopez was responsible for the disappearances of the young girls and didn't really wish to convince an investigation. That is terrible, I guess. Yeah, that's classic. Nor had Lopez been caught doing anything criminal with the nine-year-old other than claiming to be lost and allegedly attempting to abduct her. At no point in the incident did Lopez use physical coercion or grab the girl. Great, okay, so there's no evidence. How about, how about, novel idea, we try and find some. And uh, the officer found out that Lopez was a vagrant from Colombia, so he simply decided to have him deported. The officer, oh wait, where are we? Oh, he's in Peru. I'm sorry, I forgot that he went to Peru. This is all happening in Peru. <laughs> Why don't you pay attention? <laughs> I saw someone comment on a video. It's like Simon just reads the scripts and it's like, yeah, I know. And then he was absolutely bang on. So they said, I bet he doesn't remember like 90% of it a week later as like a, a joke uh, or like a dig. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it's not untrue. It's not untrue, but I'm okay with it. I've embraced that. I enjoy it. It's like, I wish I could do the same for movies, because then it's like I'd watch the movie again two weeks later and be like, wow, that was great. What's that? It's not my joke. Someone made a joke about one of the best things about having one of those men in black things, you know, where they and they take away your memories. It's like you see a really good movie and they're like, great, let's see that movie again. The officer ordered the missionary to drive Lopez to the border and release him, which the woman dutifully did. What? What are you talking about? Not Europe, probably Latin America. If some police officer, if I'd taken a criminal out of the good of my own heart and taken him and dropped him off at a police station, they were like, uh, yeah, now you're actually gonna have to drive him to the border and drop him off. I'd be like, uh, I don't, I don't think, I don't think that you can tell me what to do. <laughs> Hard pass. Thanks. How about you drive him yourself, you lazy p or better yet, do some actual police work. The officer then presumably went back to sitting on his big fat ass. Yes. Pedro Lopez returned to Bogota, where in 1978 he abducted, raped, and strangled a young girl whose name and exact age remain undisclosed. Her remains were not found until four months later. Uh, and Lopez was not placed on the list of potential suspects. In 1979, in Espinal, uh, Lopez is known to have abducted, raped, and strangled another girl named Flora Alba Sanchez. Her body was found months later on the outskirts of El Espinal, and her grieving mother identified her by the dress that she'd been wearing. Once again, Lopez was not placed on any list of police suspects at this time. Moreover, both of these girls were from poor families, and according to typical police conduct at the time, the cases were not really worthy of many, if any, police resources to investigate. Yeah, I mean, I, there's lots of other good things to spend your money on. That's lit. there's literally nothing. It's like the murder, the, the serial murder of children. The serial, hang on, rape murder and children of children. There's nothing more important. There is no worse crime other than maybe genocide. And that's like, even then it's like, the fact that it's maybe, it's like insane. I mean, genocide's worse, because then you're wiping out an entire population of people. But let's just say that we, it's really terrible to rank these things. But let's just say genocide's 100. Like at a 99.9 .9 is the uh, rape and murder of multiple children. Police, what are you up to? Stop smoking the whatever that Colombian fake crack was and do some f***ing work. In April 1979, Pedro Lopez traveled to Ecuador, where he settled in the mountain city of Ambato. He it had a moderately large population of a couple of hundred thousand, into which Lopez melted as a drifter among a fairly sizable homeless community. Lopez would later say, Ecuadorian girls are gentler and more trusting than Colombian girls. They never scream. They expect nothing. They are innocent. On May the 5th, 1979, Lopez approached Hortensia Luzada, uh, Luzada, a young girl selling newspapers to supplement her family's income. Lopez asked Hortensia to be his guide. He led the girl to the outskirts of town where he sexually assaulted and murdered her and then buried her body underneath the bridge. In her shallow grave, she was shrouded in the newspaper she'd been selling that day. No police investigation followed her disappearance. Therefore, Pedro Lopez extended his activities across all 11 Ecuadorian provinces. In Ambato itself, young girls started going missing at an alarming rate. Panic's parents reported the disappearances to the police. They refused to investigate. The official police line in 1979 was that these girls were likely runaways. The police, if 
dude. One girl runs away. Okay. Two girls run away. Mm, maybe we should pay attention. Three, four, five. When do you start doing some actual police work? I'd say fucking first one. It's a young child. Christ. It's like, yeah, the child ran away. Well, go fucking find them. What the f Sorry, there's going to be so many bleeps in this one. This drives me insane. The police even made some demented comments about how the girls may have failed their school exam. Exa I don't even know what to say anymore. In reality, there were just a couple of reasons for police in action. One, Lopez was not the only predator active in Umbato at the time. Sex traffickers conducted a roaring trade by abducting and shipping off young girls to parts unknown. That's another one of those 99.9 .9 crimes. How about you do something about the sex trafficking? What literally else are you doing? A civil war is less important than this. It really is. Uh, and these criminals usually had connections to the police where they handed out bribes like candy in a highly corrupt system. Oh, well, there's our explanation. The police are pieces of sh**. Uh, the police allegedly may have assumed the disappearances were connected to the sex traffickers and abstained from rocking the boat by even starting the most cursory investigation. Two, the police generally did not investigate crimes committed against the local poor. Police resources and manpower were limited due to low government funding, and these resources were focused on serving the wealthier citizenry. Wow, that is mega, mega shitty. The authorities were extremely reluctant to get mired in the exponentially higher number of cases that occurred in poor communities and would only do so if things became direly serious. Otherwise, the impoverished citizens of Ambato largely handled local policing and justice on their own via vigilantism, feuds, revenge killings, and mob rule. In this case, parents put up signs all over the city, offered rewards for information, but to no avail. Then, on February the 14th, 1980, even over Yakome went missing while walking alone in downtown Ambato to visit her father at work. However, her father was not poor. He owned a large chain of bakeries across the region and was a respected businessman in the community. When he informed the police, they were forced to sit up and pay attention. Finally, the police had taken notice of one of the disappearances. This further lit a fire under the parents of the other missing girls, and their voices were getting louder and louder in the community and in the press. A few weeks later, yeah, this is the thing. It's like if one of my kids went missing and the police weren't doing anything, I'd be like, well, let's uh, let's get some private investigators. Let's spend some money because I could literally think of nothing more important to spend money on. It's like literally like uh, it's just like just use it. How much does it cost? Don't care. Just go. Just get started. Come on. A few weeks later, flash flooding uncovered the remains of four girls who had been murdered and buried at various locations along a river near Ambato. It was at this point that the police realized that they were dealing with a serial killer. The city went into high alert. Then on March the 8th, 1980, the police found I Ivanova's body lying in a farm shed on the edge of town. She was identified by her devastated father. Pedro Lopez had decided upon a truly sickening way to wreak revenge on humankind for the way he had been treated his entire life. If he had lost his innocence at the age of eight, he would do the same to others. Meanwhile, because he had gone so far undetected, his sense of self-righteousness and narcissism attained delusional levels. As he later stated, I am God, I give life, and I take it away. The Festival of Fruits and Flowers It is Sunday, March the 9th, 1980. Today was Ambato's local festival of fruits and flowers. Market stalls were duly set up in the plaza, filled to the brim with vegetables, fresh cut flowers, textiles, along with vendors selling hot food and sweet pastries. The mood of the festival was slightly soured by the news of a serial killer and abductor of young girls being at large in the community. Public concern and frustration had been building in Ambato for months, and the highly publicized discovery of Ivanova Yakome's body the day before had the same effect as waving around a blowtorch in a dynamite factory. Pedro Lopez attended the markets, selling small trinkets, cheap bracelets, and padlocks. There he spotted Maria Ramon Pavida, age 12, who was helping out her mother, Kalina, running a hot food stand. Lopez lingered at the market for the majority of the day, staring at the young girl. Then, at 4 p.m., Lopez approached the stall and asked Kalina what sort of food she was offering. Lopez appeared indecisive and took a sweet time looking in all the pots. At the same time, Lopez kept looking at Kalina's daughter as if he was trying to get her attention. He kept gesturing to her to come over. Maria told Told her mother that this man was looking at her funny and that she felt creeped out. That <laughs> there's a child getting a big serial killer in large. How about how about we look at the guy, that weird pedo looking dude, who keeps staring at the kids? How about we look at him and be like, maybe it's him. <laughs> maybe. Maybe it's that weird guy. Mm? Police? Maybe? Mm? No. Over in once in police. Woo, wait. Oh, I skipped a whole paragraph. Hang on, someone goes into police custody, how exciting. In other circumstances, perhaps one might simply tell the man to stop looking at your daughter or even tell the man that he's being a creep. 
and to piss off. The more overprotective fathers among us may have threatened to punch the man and send his teeth clattering down his foul-smelling throat, but these were not ordinary circumstances. Everybody knew about the children's disappearances. The police had accomplished nothing for months, and so, in the eyes of the citizens of Ambato, a strange man trying to gain the attention of a young girl in the marketplace was enough to warrant the utmost hostility and suspicion. Kalina Ramon Paveda yelled at the man and quickly whipped up a mob who chased Pedro Lopez across the marketplace, roughed him up, and then handed him over to the police on suspicion of being the local child murderer. Fuck, brilliant! <laughs> There's so many pages left that I know this isn't the end, but I mean, come on, why can't we just end it there? He was murdered by a mob. Ah, oh, god damn. Once in police custody, Pedro Lopez denied all charges and insisted he was, quote, a good person with a pure heart. Or maybe he shouldn't be staring at kids. Weirdo. Police interrogation techniques remained standard at the beginning until they found out he was not an Ecuadorian, but a Colombian who was staying in his country without a visa. At this point, the police subjected Pedro Lopez to a severe beating in order to extract a confession out of him. Still, Pedro Lopez did not yield and continued to protest his innocence. He was thrown in a cell. Meanwhile, in order to extract information out of the suspect, police captain Pastor Gonzalez. Uh, was made Lopez's cellmate, where he posed as a fellow rapist. Because of the captain's first surname, Pastor, he's often misrepresented in true crime shows as being an undercover priest. It took Pastor Gonzalez a few days to get the suspect. Oh, okay. Good extra work there, David. I like it. It took Pastor Gonzalez a few days to get the suspect talking, and nearly a month for him to slowly extract all the relevant information. Pedro, whoa! That is some serious commitment! He's in there for a month! And it's not going to work because there's so many pages left in this document. That's so disappointing. Pastor sounds like a legend. I mean, he's part of this horribly corrupt police force. I hope he's that one legend who isn't corrupt and is the good cop who's, you know, gonna... I like this guy. That's like, legendary. Pedro Lopez confided in Selma that since arriving in Ecuador, he had been killing an average of three girls a week all over the country. But that, unfortunately, was just the beginning. During a later press interview, Pastor Gonzalez would state, For 27 days, I barely slept for fear that I would be strangled, but I tricked Lopez into confessing. He boasted about his murders, one after another, taking place in Ecuador, Colombia, and Peru. It went beyond my worst nightmares. He told me everything. Scattered among long hours of Pedro's long, incoherent rantings were dribs and drabs of grisly information. Eventually, Gonzalez became so sickened and traumatized by what he was hearing that he had to abandon his mission, bang on the cell door, and ask his fellow officers to release him. The Monster of the Andes Pedro Lopez confessed to abducting, raping, and murdering 110 girls between the ages of 8 and 12 in Ecuador. He is... Wow. Maybe this is why this guy's name is familiar to me, because you see him at the top of those lists of serial killers, because 110 absolutely puts you up there in, like, the worst ones ever. That's crazy. Between April 1979 and March 1980, he basically did it in a year. In addition, he admitted to killing 140 girls in, the, in Colombia between 1973 and 1977, and further 50 to 80 in Peru during his brief stay in the country in 1978. What the f***? This guy's got to be one of the most worst serial killers of all time. No doubt. That amounts to approximately two girls per month in Colombia, one to two girls per week during his time in Peru, and between two and three girls per week in Ecuador. The increase in frequency from Colombia to Peru to Ecuador would imply a typical pattern of escalation, albeit on a staggeringly larger scale. In total, Pedro Lopez confessed to, confessed to killing over 300 children in a roughly seven-year period. That is so... that is so crazy. Lopez would later say in a press interview, I'm the worst of the worst. Perhaps I took it so far because of my ignorance. I'm the lowest of the low. Perhaps even a complete animal. Yeah, you are. Piece of shit. Lopez had a specific type of victim. I walked among the market, searching for a girl with a certain look on her face, a look of innocence and beauty. She would be a good girl, perhaps working with her mother. I watched, sometimes, for two or three days, waiting for the moment when she was alone. I don't like this at all. I have a young daughter. This is some f***ed up shit. Lopez's modus operandi was to select girls who appeared to be easy targets and whom the police would not work hard to find. He would mostly target girls of full, partial in, of full or partial indigenous descent, once saying, I spent many days following rich families and their beautiful blonde daughters, but I never got the chance to take some. Their parents were too watchful. He would target poor girls. He would target girls selling things on street corners or aboriginal girls living in the depths of the countryside. Man, this is so f***ed up. I don't like this. I don't like... Like, it's so hard not to imagine this for myself. And that is really... I don't know. It's not nice. It's not nice at all. And it's like, you want to be a parent who, like... I want to be a kind of parent who's not 
you know, leaning over my kids' shoulders, like, at every moment. And to, to be fair, I'm not, like, raising my kids in, like, Civil War-torn police piece of shit Peru. But it's still, like, there are bad people out there. And it's like, how do you not keep it? And then, you you know, there's still those stories that, that happen today, even of, like, you know, that Madeleine McCann case. And it's like, if that happened to me, it would destroy me. It would destroy my life. And I just, it's hard to think about. It's really hard to think about. I don't normally think about it, but then you get one of these, like, episodes like this, and it's then you end up thinking about it. And it's like, man... Lopez would never physically coerce the girls to go with him and charm them to draw them away in order to have plausible deniability should the abduction be interrupted. Lopez would pretend to be lost in need of a guide, or to gain their attention by offering them cheap trinkets and baubles. His general approach was to appear as a gentle, harmless, and as helpless as possible so the young girls would take pity on him. The alleged numbers are horrifying enough, so I'm just going to be quite swift and matter-in-fact about what came next. Lopez would take the girls to isolated areas frequently on the edge of town, then sexually assault them. He would then leave the girls alive and sleep next to them the entire night, whispering comforting things to them to calm them down, making them think they'd get to return home the next day. Then at dawn, Lopez would sexually assault the victims again and strangle them. Lopez said he waited for dawn so he could see their eyes when he did so, a fixation shared by Israel Keys from a previous video. Lopez would then prop up the body of the victim and talk to it for hours, sometimes having what he called a tea party or else by playing one-sided children's games. He frequently referred to his victims as dolls. Eventually, Lopez would become bored, conceal the body, and leave. After a cooling-off period of about a week and, more recently, only a day or two, he would go and find another victim. Due to the high number of Lopez's victims, more than once, Lopez would bring multiple victims to the same site as previous crimes. I appreciate that David, you left that brief, to be honest, because I don't want the details. Lopez's pretend preference was for innocent young girls, and therefore he did not abduct girls uh, of 8 to 12 who were working as sex workers, which tragically was practically a common thing at the time in impoverished urban areas. The reason for this was his revulsion against what his mother stood for, and also his grieving for the loss of his own innocence when he was sexually assaulted at the age of 8. Dude, what the f***, man? So just kill the predators. I don't understand why you don't just kill the predators. That is so much more sensible i mean obviously not sensible you're a complete f***ing sicko as such lopez's lopez rationalized that by murdering the girls he was helping them by sparing them from a life where they would grow older lose their innocence and suffer at the hands of other people that's some crazy rationalization or in other words become like his mother or the women that he saw in pornographic magazines Instead, according to Lopez, he was sending the young innocent straight to heaven. During an interview, Lopez stated that it took the girls 5 to 15 minutes to die, adding, I was very considerate. I would spend a long time with them, making sure they were dead. I would use a mirror to check if they were still breathing. What's a mirror got to do with it? And you're not considerate. You sexually assaulted them. If elements of Lopez's early backstory previously made you sympathetic towards the man, I'll be genuinely curious what you think of him now. <laughs> uh, look, the guy had a super f***ed up upbringing. Lots of people do this guy's particularly so but there are lots of people who don't murder 300 innocent children um who had horrible upbringings worse upbringings than this guy no sympathy the police were not sure what to make of pedro lopez the numbers he was claiming to have killed were so large 110 victims in ecuador alone they thought he could just be a raving madman conducting wild stories after spending so many days in jail beyond his confessions all they had was a mob picking him up for being creepy around a young girl in front of her mother and out staying his welcome in ecuador they kept lopez sweet by plying him with cigarettes coffee beer and fried chicken he remembered a surprising number of dates, times, and victim descriptions. Meanwhile, Lopez began to call Pastor Gonzalez Papa, which psychologists theorized was because for almost his entire life, Lopez lacked a father figure who is kind to him. I feel just uh, probably completely wrong on this, but this is what happens when it's a cold read. I feel that maybe there's something to that. Maybe this guy is crazy and he hasn't killed all these people. Fingers crossed, I guess. After some more rounds of questioning, the people, the police asked Lopez to lead them to where he'd buried and concealed the bodies of his victims. That would determine once and for all whether the deranged lunatic was telling the truth. In, Lope, in total, Lopez led the police to 57 sites where the bodies of young girls were found, along with an additional 36 sites where no bodies were uncovered. Okay. So, uh, no, no, I was wrong. He is a horrible murderer. In the latter cases, possible explanations for the missing bodies range from flooding and mudslides to animals consuming the remains, or quite simply, Lopez misremembering the exact spot where he buried or concealed a victim. By his own admission, Lopez had murdered a lot of victims in an 11 month period, but the discovery of roughly half of the 110 claimed victims indicated that Lopez was indeed telling something approaching the truth. As for correlating the claims with the missing persons cases, unfortunately, the poor did not always report disappearances or come forward.
forth after the fact. Many of the children had no birth certificates or identification or any existence on government records whatsoever. The police themselves kept inadequate records when it came to reports of disappearances coming in from the poor, and as previously stated, there were other reasons for why a young girl might disappear in Ecuador, sex trafficking being the foremost among them. Six weeks elapsed, with Lopez taking police to site after site multiple times a day. He would claim and coldly point out where the bodies were, as if what he had done was normal. At one of the first grave sites on the outskirts of Abato, police located the body of Hortensa Lazada, who was killed 11 months prior. Her father, Leonis, was called to identify her remains, which he did by recognizing her clothing. Pedro Lopez was standing right there, protected by police, and Leonis just wanted to kill him. Gradually, a mob arrived and began throwing rocks at the police. They wanted to lynch Lopez. From there on out, Lopez was taken out as disguised as a police officer while guarding, while guiding police to new grave sites. During one outing, Lopez grabbed a girl's skull, placed it under his arm as he posed with it, and asked one of the cops to take a picture. They quickly grabbed it off him. Lopez wanted the macabre image to immortalize him in the history books. As Lopez would state multiple times to the press, now that he was arrested, his life might be cut short by either extradition and execution or murder in prison. He wanted to make sure that he had some impact on history. <laughs> It's like, yeah, I don't know, that lynch mob, kind of okay with that. It's like, yeah, yeah. If I was involved in this, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, get him! <laughs> Good lord. In general, Lopez loved all the attention from this grim spectacle. He did not show any remorse, saying, When one dies, one totally loses his emotions, his vision, his ability to see. In death, you can forget about who you are, because everything you did has now evaporated into the void. Ultimately, Pedro Lopez was diagnosed as a sociopath with antisocial personality disorder. He did not know right from wrong. He had no remorse, no empathy. Psychologists speculated that if his upbringing had been different, Pedro would not have wound up with such mental pathologies, or at least they would not be as pronounced and exacerbated as they were. In short, Lopez is considered likely to be more of a serial killer created by nurture rather than nature. Yeah, that's what I was saying earlier, how this is the making of a serial killer, whereas in the previous episode, Israel Keys, he was born. He was mostly born. This guy seems to be mostly made. Nevertheless, many high-profile true crime shows have depicted him as a bad apple from the very start for dramatic purposes. I hope with this show, I sometimes doubt about it. Like, I don't like true crime. I like true crime where it's a procedural and we solve the crime and all of this stuff. I don't like murder porn. I don't like exploitation. And I realize... I don't want to also appear hypocritical. It's a fine line sometimes, isn't it? Mm. I hope I'm not crossing that line today. Let's move on. The Twist Pedro Lopez was charged with 110 counts of murder in Ecuador, largely based on his own confessions. At trial on July the 31st, 1981, Lopez pled guilty to 57 murders where bodies had been found. But unfortunately, in Ecuador at the time, there were no consecutive sentences, and being charged under more than one category of a crime was considered unconstitutional. Wait, <laughs> that makes no sense. That basically means it's like, yeah, 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 you murdered two people, we can only try you for one murder because, well, we already got you for one murder but you killed two. <laughs> that makes no sense, Ecuador. I guess that's at the time. They obviously changed that because it was insane. That meant that if you abducted, raped, and killed one person or a hundred or a thousand, you'd receive exactly the same sentence. Insanity. And so, for the abduction, rape, and murder of 57 to 110 young girls in Ecuador, Pedro Lopez received the maximum sentence at the time of just 16 years. Oh, that's seriously all you got. That equates to 1.5 months to 3 months jail time for every child that Lopez murdered in Ecuador. If we add the estimated death tolls from Peru and Colombia, roughly 300, why don't we just send him to Peru or Colombia where they execute people? I mean, one of those, they've got to be executing people? Come on! Uh, roughly 300. Lopez spent two weeks in jail for each murder. Uh, and Pedro Lopez would be freed from prison before he reached his 50th birthday. The low maximum sentence was partially due to prison overcrowding. When later asked about the killer's release, Ecuadorian prison minister Pablo Figuera uh, would say, Yes, it does sound strange but that is our law. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, this guy's the prison minister. It's not his problem. I mean, this is a failure of the justice system, not the prison system. This P Pablo dude, the prison minister, should be focusing on all the horrible rape that's apparently going on in the prison. That's a problem for him. If, that all fr if all that frustrates you, please know that you're not alone. I caused some very minor property damage in my apartment when I first found that out. It's pretty outrageous, isn't it? I feel like I got a lot of my rage out earlier when I found out about like quite the extent of it. Um, but I'm kind of I'm kind of hoping this is going to come around and you know he's going to get murdered in prison fairly quick, right? Child murderers don't do well in prison. If you killed a hundred children, 
someone's going to murder you. Good for them. <laughs> Lopez spent two years in an Ambato jail before he was transferred to prison in Quito, the capital city of Ecuador. There, he was transferred to the murder and rapist wing. Lopez passed his days alone, smoking basuco, that cocaine-lined cigarettes that he enjoyed as a youth. Uh, I'm not even sure I should be surprised that he managed to obtain them in prison, given what I've just written about his sentencing. Lopez would spend his day reading pornography, scribbling in his diary, and carving coins with Jesus on one side and the devil on the other. Lopez gave interviews with the press whenever he could. He enjoyed the attention. He concocted a story that he had a split personality and that a man named Jorge Patino was actually responsible for the murders. Lopez said, I did not commit the murders. I participated in the acts and was involved in them. Patino was threatening to kill me, and if I tried to leave him, he probably would have killed me. It's uncertain whether this Jorge Patino was actually a manifestation of Pedro Lopez's mental illness or just a fabrication that Lopez used to catch press attention. I'll leave it to you to decide. Throughout his 16-year sentence, Pedro Lopez repeatedly vowed that if he was released, he would kill again. Dude, that's f***ed up. How has no one killed you? You've been in prison for two years? Why has no one killed you? Pedro Lopez was freed from prison. How has no one killed you after 16 years? On August the 31st, 1994, after serving 14 years of his original 16-year sentence, why did he get two years off? He was released after good behavior. Are you f***ing me? He was saying he's going to kill and murder people when he's released. How has no one murdered him in prison? How is he using drugs in prison? This is... I'm going to cause some property damage. This is insanity. The parents of the victims were devastated and called for a vigilante justice and called for vigilante justice to kill Lopez. They already had pooled their resources and together placed a twenty-five thousand dollar bounty on Lopez's head. I mean, uh, rare, rare to be like, yeah, bounty, good thing, but f- yeah, I'd contribute to that bounty. They should have a GoFundMe for that shit. Meanwhile, <laughs> steady on there, facts boy. I'm saying that in jest. Please don't set up a GoFundMe to kill someone, no matter how bad it is. And I def- definitely don't contribute to one if you see it, because if that person dies and gets murdered by someone, and you paid for it through GoFundMe, you're probably a little bit fucked, aren't you? So I take all of it back. It was a joke. It's not something I would ever do. Don't do it yourself. Okay? I think we covered it. Okay, I get it. Just stop talking. Meanwhile, a few hours after his release, Lopez was scooped up again by Ecuadorian authorities. He was ordered to be deported back into Colombia. He was handed over the next day. Colombian authorities arrested Lopez for the murder of Flora Alba Sanchez, aged 12, in 1979. They were forced to find Lopez guilty of murder in Colombia and put him away for life or else put him in front of a firing squad. Now we're talking. <laughs> People love to comment about my bloodlust in the comments. And I'm like, I don't know, man. I started this show being like, I don't know if I believe in the death penalty. And now I'm like, firing squad, get it, yes! Kill him! Kill him! Meanwhile, public pressure grew in Ecuador to reform the sentencing of multiple murderers, and a few years later, a maximum sentence was increased from 16 to 25 years. Pedro Lopez was found guilty of the murder of Flora Alba Sanchez, though he was not prosecuted for any of the other 140 murders that he claimed he committed in Colombia, nor was he ever called to account for any murders in Peru. Then, in late 1995, Lopez was declared insane and locked in an asyl- asylum in Bogota. After a little over two years' incarceration in the asylum, a psychiatrist evaluated Pedro Lopez and declared him sane. Lopez was released back into an to an outraged public in February 1998 on the condition that he continue with his psychiatric treatment and report once a month to a judge. Are you absolutely f***ing me? Are you f***ing me? When he's declared sane, he goes back to prison! What?! Additionally, Lopez had to pay back a bail bond of just $50, which is roughly 16 cents per victim. Upon his release in early 1998, Lopez traveled to El Aspinal where, to visit his mother Belinda. According to her, Lopez greeted her by saying that she could get down on her knees so he could bless her, to which Belinda replied that she was his mother and if anyone should get down on their knees, it was him. Pedro Lopez promptly got down on one knee so he could receive his mother's blessing. He then started aggressively demanding an early share of his inheritance. Penelo replied that she was dirt poor and asked her son how, he was going to, how she was going to give him anything, when all she owned was a chair and a bed. Lopez then dragged the bed and the chair out through onto the veranda in full public view and shouted into the street, Who is going to buy these things? Otherwise, I will light them on fire. A woman came forward and bought the furniture, after which Lopez promptly left. 
It's a rather bizarre scene that I didn't expect to find in this part of the episode. That was the last time anyone reported seeing Pedro Lopez ever again. In 2002, Interpol issued an alert to apprehend Pedro Lopez as he became a prime suspect in yet another child murder in Colombia. Beyond that, there was no significant spike in missing person cases in Colombia, Peru, or Ecuador in the years immediately following Lopez's release. Nearly a quarter of a century later, we still have no idea where Lopez went after visiting his mother in El Espinal. We have no idea whether the monster of the Andes killed again, and we have no idea if he's currently dead or alive. At the time of writing, Pedro Lopez would be 73 years old. That's the end. That's the end of today's episode. I've never been more disappointed. I mean, I we have these episodes where it's like people commit horrible crimes, but at the end... They either kill themselves, they get killed, or they end up in prison forever. This guy went free, and he was convicted of killing over 100 children. Or 57 or whatever. This is the most f***ed up thing that I've ever come across in my life. It's ridiculous. Dismembered Appendices Whenever I sit down to write this section, the theme music Jen regularly inserts here immediately starts playing in my head, and I don't stop until I finish writing everything. <laughs> And bear in mind that with multiple drafts and editing, this is a considerable amount of time to have a brief looping song stuck in your head. Not really relevant, but I thought I'd try and lighten the mood a little after today's bollocking of an episode. Number two. Numerous... Oh, that's it. That's the fact. <laughs> it's about David's writing process. I kind of like it. Numerous authorities have speculated whether Pedro Lopez is still alive and whether he continued killing. Certainly, as the old cliche goes, a serial killer doesn't usually stop until they're stopped. And there hasn't been that level of death toll anywhere in South America that would imply Lopez had begun his handiwork again. But there are plenty of exceptions to that cliched rule, like the Golden State Killer, for example. So it is possible that Lopez merely ran off somewhere and stopped killing, or at least he stopped killing as frequently. As for Lopez being able to conceal himself all these years, he spent his entire life as a vagrant, and it's entirely conceivable Lopez could disappear into the vast masses of the poor and the cracks of the underworld yet again. Multiple experts agree that if Lopez is alive, he would eventually have to flee Spanish speaking America, where it'd be more likely to be uh, to be frequently recognized and probably would head north to try and slip into the United States or Canada. Assuming, of course, that he did not manage to sneak his way onto a ship or a plane. While in prison, Lopez boasted that one day he would write a book on his crimes. It seems dubious that someone who grew to be as narcissistic as Lopez with a literal god complex could have kept such a low profile for decades. Number three. Speaking of lightening the mood, I've referred several times throughout this episode to how many officials in Colombia were corrupt. Happily, this includes prison psychiatrists. While it is possible that Pedro Lopez could have behaved himself to pull wool over the psychiatrist's eyes in order to be released, one theory goes that vengeful families bribed the psychiatrist to declare Lopez sane. Thereupon, Lopez could be tracked, and after he was released, he was discreetly murdered. That would explain why someone as recognizable and as unhinged as Lopez was never heard from again. As Carlina Ramon Paveda, mother of the last known girl that Lopez tried to Doctor said, he won't live long, it will be a kindness to the world for someone to murder this fiend. Maybe that is why we haven't heard of more missing girls. Perhaps someone, even the police in Colombia or Ecuador, have already killed him. Though the fact that we need to discuss the possibilities of extrajudicial killings to get any sense of justice or safety out of this story stands as a condemnation of the judicial systems of both Ecuador and Colombia, where the state ends, frontier justice begins. Yeah, entirely agree. It's insanity that this is how we ended up. And also, um, about the, the discreet killing, maybe we will get some closure on this. Because it's only been, did they say 20 years? No, 10 years, 20 years, something like that. It's not been that long since he's been murdered. So maybe in the next 20, 30 years, someone will be on their deathbed or know about this secret. And just as they're, they're about to get, ah, I got him killed. And then we know. And that'll be great. And they'll be like, his body is here. It's in many pieces. And then we'll be like, ah. Number four, not that it should really matter, but in case you were wondering, with the potential victim count of over 300 children, Pedro Lopez is one of the most prolific serial killers in human history, alongside the likes of Luis Garavito, Harold Shipman, and Javad Iqbal. Where exactly Lopez falls on this list depends how you are deciding upon the numbers. For instance, are we counting only proven murders, murders that the killer himself claimed, or murders alleged by the police and the public? Lopez is only confirmed to have killed 57 children. Only. Only. Good lord. 
uh, all from Ecuador, but likely killed similar numbers in Colombia and Peru. So if we triple the murder count, Lopez ranks second or third after Gar- Garavito and Shipman. If we count all 300 as realistic, that places Lopez either first or second in history. As for the numbers themselves, all occurring in just seven years, that's entirely feasible. Unlike a killer such as Andre Chikatilo, who murdered a likely 57 people over 12 years, Pedro Lopez was not married, employed, and did not lead a double life. As a vagrant, he could devote the majority of his time to murdering people. In that sense, especially because of the indifference and impotence of the police, the idea that Lopez could kill three girls a week is entirely possible. Indeed, in 2006, the Guinness Book of World Records listed Pedro Lopez as the world's most prolific serial killer, but it got rid of the category because numerous people complained that it glorified his deeds and it set a benchmark for future psychos. They're not wrong. That's, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not happy about that. Of course I'm not happy about that. This was a rough episode. Um, Just going to end it there.